Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Um, in today's video, I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue my ongoing analysis into theories. Today, I'm going to do uh, race theory, and um, the idea behind this presentation is not that, as in, as is the case with all the videos that I do, not that I'm giving you a comprehensive account. Again, this is supplemental information, and what I've done is I've tried to sort of delineate um, sort of seminal concepts within the overarching. Uh, notion of race theory and present it uh, in this ongoing analysis into theories. So uh, I'll specifically be discussing in race theory um, the black and Chicano, Chicana um, studies and conceptions of race. I wanted to make sure that I incorporated uh, the Chicano, Chicana voice because uh, I've written on it before um, quite extensively both in the blogosphere uh, and in larger publications and I wanted to incorporate their voice into this account of uh, race theory as well. So, with that, let's begin. Section 7. Alright. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is, I'm not going to do a discourse in critical race theory. There's a distinction between race theory and critical race theory. I'm not going to really address the distinction. The main difference is critical race theory primarily deals or looks at race within, with respect or the view of sort of legal studies. So I'm not going to do critical race theory. Um, I'm talking about race theory proper and my analysis is an explication of race theory and not critical race theory. If you're interested in um, critical race theory, you know, read uh, or look it up uh, at your leisure. Maybe sometime in the future I might do another video on critical race theory. but. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is what I'm focusing on in this video. So, to begin, uh, I wanted to read a quote just so that we can set the stage. Uh, and the quote comes from sentencingproject.org. So, sentencingproject.org had the citation and I just wanted to incorporate it. More than 60% of the people in prison are now racial or ethnic minorities. For black males in their 20s, one in every eight is in prison or jail on any given day. So one in eight ethnic minorities, uh, black men specifically, they said, in their 20s, one in eight of every black man in their 20s is in prison or in jail on any given day. These trends have been intensified by the disproportionate impact of the war on drugs, in which three-fourths of all prisons, uh, all persons in prison um, are drug offense, right, and they're people of color. So it's important to recognize that uh, with respect to these incarceration numbers, we want to ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, why do the incarcer incarceration rates and the incarceration numbers reflect such a high level, such a disproportionate level um, of the minority population? Within the population, the minority represent the majority of those that are incarcerated. And the question is why? Um, I'm not going to get into the political debates. I'm not a pundit. I don't do that. My analysis is purely objective. Um, so the answer will be an objective answer. Part of the answer will be because the people put themselves there. Another part of the answer will be that the system put the people there. Which one's right is up for you to decide, but I'll present both, both answers. Uh, the reason why there's a disproportionate rate is because people put themselves there. Part of the answer is that the system put those people there, and we'll look through this. I'm not going to do an analysis, and this, uh, to be clear, this analysis on race theory is not an analysis on criminality and incarceration rates uh, and so on, um, but it does impact, and I just think that that quote really uh, uh, identified what is at stake here. So let's begin with the notion of the origins of race, right, the origins of race. Alright, and this comes from... Uh, Howard Winnett, um, Race and Race Theory, in the Annual Review of Sociology. Winnett, for me, has written a very, very comprehensive account. Most of uh, the theory that I'm going to incorporate in this discussion, as you'll see um, nearing the end of the section on page 22, um, most of this comes from, this idea comes from um, Winnett's um, concept of the racial formation theory. So a lot of this discourse of race comes from Winnett's uh, conception of racial formation theory. Um, and I'm going to use racial formation theory uh, in general to structure this account of race specifically. All right. So um, 
The first thing, when it defines race as, and here's the quote, he defines race as concept that signifies and symbolizes socio-political conflicts and interests in reference to different types of human bodies, right? So concept that signifies and symbolizes social socio-political conflict. So we're talking about conflict, right? And it's interesting to note that in his definition of race, he incorporates socio-political conflict and the interests that are represented in different human bodies, right? So it's the relationship, the socio-political relationship, um, and the conflict that emerges from the socio-political relationship as pertaining to different types of human bodies, right? So when we're talking about race, we're talking about human bodies, and right, we're talking specifically about the origins, how race came to be. Um, the genealogy of race is based on a number of factors, right? It's based on global, global economy. And the genealogy of race is based on global economy, the conquest, I hate that word, of the Americas, right? The conquest of the Americas, Atlantic slave trade, and so on. I'm not going to write all these down. Atlantic slave trade and so on. Um, lastly, and arguably most importantly, this, this notion of race was initially supported and introduced into our discourse by science, right, by the scientific community. And in my discussion previously, a few uh, videos, probably several videos ago, I discussed uh, homogeneity, hybridity, and heterogeneity. And in that, we saw how science introduced race into our uh, contemporary discourse and how arguably science will eliminate race from our contemporary discourse. Um, but here's a quote, um, science number four. At the beginning of the 20th century, a nearly comprehensive view of race, of the race concept, still located it at the biological level. So that we were talking about race, race as biological. Right? So, at this level, scientifically, at the beginning of the 20th century, a nearly comprehensive view of the race concept still located it, it at the biological level. On this account, race, races were natural, right? When we talk about race at the beginning in, the, in this origin of race, we looked at race as being natural, right? Race is biological and therefore natural. Natural distinctions. among right. So when we're talking about race, um, we were thinking of race in terms of natural distinctions among human beings. Their characteristics were essential and given immutable. Right? These characteristics were immutable. And this is when in 2000 um, in the publication that I told you before. So the idea in this concept of the origins of race is there was a shift in the global economy. Instead of having small independent, independent tribal societies that did not have um, commercial exchange, or commercial exchange was limited, what ends up happening is with the growth of the global economy, there was a um, huge demand for increased labor. And the question is, well, where is this labor going to come from? In a little bit, I'll discuss how the justification for the enslavement of an entire continent of people was done. Um, and this is, I know, a bit, it's a bit audacious, but with respect to the enslavement of the population, the point was we are expanding the global economy and the expansion of the global economy is going to require a global labor force, an unprecedented labor force. Um, and the orchestration of this labor force would require international efforts, which is why Portugal, Spain, the United States, Britain, everybody wanted a piece of the continent of Africa because they recognized that the potential labor force there to be exploited meant their, their uh, increased gains and increased profits, right? But there needed to be a justification for this for the enslavement of this population, right? We needed to arrive at it. And obviously, this is this is quite obviously um, uh, pre-capitalist notions. But we recognize that we're going to need labor in order for any.